When Tilly Smith was just 10 years old, she saved the lives of as many as 100 people in one day. How? She ran into a burning building, grabbed 50 people under each arm, and then threw them all to safety. OK, no, not really. That's not what happened. It was much simpler than that, but I think no less extraordinary. She and her family were vacationing on a beach on the coast of Thailand when the water started to bubble up. Oceans started to disappear into the distance. Two weeks earlier in geography class, she had learned a lesson on tsunamis. So that day, she recognized these signs, warned her parents, who worked with hotel staff to evacuate the beach. Her beach was the only one without reported casualties from a tsunami that impacted 14 countries. So not bad for a 10-year-old girl. OK, interesting story, but disasters are what happened to other people. It'll never happen to me. And that's what I thought. In 2013, I was in Boston watching the marathon with my family. Yeah, that Boston marathon. I was waiting for my dad, who had just finished his race, when I saw the smoke begin to rise over the finish line down the road. I froze. All around me, the runners moved forward, unaware and unresponsive to what was happening behind them. And long after the second explosion, I was still frozen. Trust me on this. In disasters, your brain isn't always on your side. Everyone reacts differently. For her book, The Unthinkable, journalist Amanda Ripley interviewed hundreds of disaster survivors in order to describe how we process these events. She details a three-stage arc of what we go through. The first stage, denial. This isn't happening to me. The second stage, deliberation. OK, what am I going to do about it? And the final stage, which she calls the decisive moment. People always talk about the danger of panicking in an emergency. But what she describes is the tendency for some people to underreact, not overreact. They freeze. What separates the ones that freeze from the ones that act? It's not fearlessness. It's not complacency. I've learned it's knowledge, planning, and practice. During the Boston Marathon bombing, I didn't have a Tilly Smith moment, farthest from. But I used that experience as the catalyst to become the kind of person who would act. Here at the University of Georgia, I've studied disaster management and have explored the question, how can we prepare for disasters? Preparedness starts first and foremost with the recognition that these events can happen and that you must take personal responsibility for your own safety. In emergency management, we seek to leverage the strengths of individuals throughout a community. The government standard for emergency preparedness is self-sufficiency without phone communications, running water, or power for 72 hours after a disaster. And by preparing for emergencies, you're reducing the strain placed on emergency responders so that they can dedicate their time and resources to the most vulnerable members of your community. Also, by preparing, you can take care of the people around you. You can respond. The term first responder is a bit confusing because in an emergency, it's rare that it's police, firefighters, or EMS that are first on scene. It's usually bystanders. And we've seen in events such as the Boston Marathon bombing that the actions taken by bystanders can be critical to saving lives. For example, Devin Wang, then a junior at Boston University, was volunteering with a medical team, tending to the exhausted runners when the bombs went off. Although she didn't have experience dealing with major trauma, she was still able to wheel the injured to safety. We saw more recently, during the Las Vegas shooting, what the power of bystanders can achieve. In the confusion, emergency medical services were unable to enter the scene, and rescue teams were dispatched to the surrounding hotels. While waiting for emergency responders, concert goers helped carry the injured to safety and stem their bleeding. One woman, Lindsay Padgett, even used her personal truck to help get the injured to ambulances. Just like in Boston, ordinary people helped evacuate the scene and provided life-saving first aid. But you don't need to know how to perform complex medical procedures in order to help out in emergencies. Remember Tilly Smith? All she needed was a little geography knowledge and the conviction to take action. By taking care of yourself first and by preparing for disasters, you empower yourself to help the people around you. Like we saw during Hurricane Harvey, the Good Samaritans who were ready for the storm were able to open up their businesses to provide shelter to those in need. In our own community during Hurricane Irma, Students helped pair those needing shelter with people offering up space in their homes. These are just a few examples of what ordinary people can achieve in disasters. So if you're wondering, how can I prepare? 
Based on any recent disaster movie, it's grab your leather pants and machine gun. It's time for the apocalypse. But I promise you, you don't need to be zombie slayer Rambo to get through the next emergency. You don't need to spend extreme amounts of time or money trying to identify every possible hazard. You don't need to become a prepper or a survivalist. You don't need to stockpile 10 years of food and 50 guns in your deluxe survival bunker. It's much easier than that. Start with yourself and work on your knowledge, planning, and practice. I know this sounds simple, because it is, but because we deny that these events can happen to us, we fail to prepare for them altogether. So first, knowledge. Be informed. Look around you in your home, in your workplace. What are the most likely hazards you might encounter? An easy way of staying informed is signing up for your local emergency alert system. Also, you can follow local public safety officials and meteorologists on social media. Going a step further, will you share information with the people around you so that they can take action? Second step, planning. Plan for these most likely scenarios. An easy way of starting your planning is building a basic emergency kit. Food, water, flashlight, batteries. Think about that 72 hours I talked about. What would you need? It's worth the investment. Who's ever been to the grocery store when there's severe weather in the forecast? Wouldn't you rather be kicking back in your pajamas with a cup of hot chocolate instead of wrestling someone for the last loaf of bread at the store? And finally, practice. Practice your plans and the actions that you might need to take. Who knows first aid? CPR. Overcome your fear of those terribly creepy CPR dummies <laughs> and get trained. And bonus credit on this if you've got a fire to get involved in local disaster response, join an organization. Throughout America, we've got community emergency response teams which provide training to volunteers on how to aid their communities during disasters. So why wait? Far too often, we put off preparing for disasters until it's too late. Amanda Ripley writes, regular people only figure into the equation as victims, which is a shame, because regular people are the most important people at a disaster scene every time. Knowledge, planning, and practice. Through these simple steps, you can prepare for disasters in order to ensure the future resilience of yourself, your neighbors, and your community. Don't just stand by, stand up and take action. Thank you. <laughs>